Hello and welcome to the Second Drafts podcast, everything you need to write, edit, and publish your way. I'm Jeremy. And I'm EJ. And today we'll be discussing how to keep things believable in your story. So, uh, suspending disbelief, as they call it there, uh, it's rather important. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Especially uh, when you're dealing with, say, a fantasy or science fiction story, but just even in general, it's definitely a very important uh, thing to keep in mind, because with the audience, if they can suspend disbelief, then they're going to be more likely to actually stay involved in your story and uh, keep reading it. And you can even sometimes build on that suspension of disbelief and uh, increase the tension for your scenes uh, to build to that climax. So you can have increasingly uh, dangerous things happening, say if you're in a murder mystery, increasing action, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if uh, you have something that's too unbelievable, it can take the audience out of the story and they'll become less involved, less interested, and really less likely to actually continue reading. And uh, I've seen it likened almost uh, sometimes to a machine. So, like, if something is missing, you know, it might still be able to function, but then the likelihood of it breaking down skyrockets, goes way up. Mm. So if one part of a scene doesn't work in the reader's eyes, it can have a domino effect on everything that kind of comes afterwards. So if they start thinking like, oh, well, that they should have broken their leg if they fell from that height. He wouldn't be able to do this. And then like everything else kind of just falls. Just collapses. Yeah, like a house of cards or something. Mm. Um, yeah, well, exactly. As a as an author, your whole purpose with writing and storytelling, I think, is, is to kind of cast a spell on your readers um, that sucks them into your story world. You know, you kind of completely want them to just slip into it and not think for a while in that sense, you know, not not realize that it's fake. I mean, we all know it's fake, <laughs> but <laughs> exactly. Uh, I mean, the fewer cracks there are that, that are showing in your story, the fewer inconsistencies and, and unreal elements people can pick out, um, the, the the more likely you will be to, to pull it off, you know. And of course, when I say people are going to be picking out the, the inconsistencies and the, the, the unreal elements, you know, you have to take into account what genre you're writing. Of course, if you're writing a fantasy with magic in it, that's not what we mean when we say unreal things. Mm-hmm. Of course, your story is going to have fantastical elements in it if that's what you're doing. But then within those rules, you're going to have to take a good look at whether they contradict each other and stuff like that. Yeah, and oftentimes, like as you were saying, they're almost like a house of cards. When you look at it, uh, generally if something is done very well, you won't really even be able to tell uh, how it's done well sometimes. like You have to really break it down into base parts, and so we'll kind of try and do that there. Um, but kind of what prompted this... I'll, explain a little bit there because uh, just an example of how it's done a little bit badly. Uh, I was recently watching the new Netflix series uh, Daredevil. Oh. And, and how is that? Uh, I personally, I do like it. Like I, I'm, I am going to uh, be complaining about it here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be ready. But uh, I do enjoy it. It's definitely better than the uh, Ben Affleck movie from yeah, yeah, please, it's got to be. <laughs> However long ago <laughs> that was. Um, but there's just a couple moments in there where it really just brought me out of it. And it was mainly to do with the action. And so there were uh, a couple moments there uh, in the story where they have uh, these ninjas. And yeah. they're not, you know, uh, realistic ninjas like... They're that classical, like, you know, they wear the the black garments and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Those type of ninjas. And they've kind of established these stories, like uh, Daredevil, and they have the Jessica Jones, and uh, they have a couple other ones on Netflix coming out, where they do have some of those fantastic elements to them, because uh, it is Marvel. 
but of course it is very grounded like it's very uh, realistic in a way and the thing that really brought me out of it was with these ninjas they were using bow and arrows and it just it didn't really mesh with the whole story like why would they use bow and arrows why would they not use guns you know it just really brought me out of it okay and on a lesser extent like this would be a little bit harder to translate uh sometimes to a book but same thing with the action scenes um the, some of the characters would have a weapon but they wouldn't actually use the weapon like uh there's a moment you know where the character's back is turned and instead they'll like elbow them instead of using their their uh their sword because it would kill them if they, <laughs> if they did yeah. use that so it's kind of almost arbitrary in a way yeah. so that kind of brought me out of it a little bit as well but uh more so just uh them using those bow and arrows like it doesn't it didn't seem to mesh with the uh modern day uh time setting that it was in yeah yeah that's kind of a i think they were torn between having a modern day setting and placing a kind of a medieval kind of fighter in there yeah and i don't think they could quite figure out what to do with <laughs> <laughs> how to mesh those two things and it's also it's definitely a little harder when your character uh, can be killed so you have to mm. kind of think about that beforehand so that might have been you know part of the reasoning why they wouldn't have uh, guns because uh, daredevil it's harder to dodge a gun than it would be probably yeah. a bow and arrow <laughs> <laughs> so, but see, that's that's a big danger of this kind of thing because now, as soon as your characters start taking, you know, making decisions that are very obviously not the best decision for the character, but the best decision for the writer, that's where you run into some serious issues because that's where the the scaffolding of your story start to sh starts to show. Yeah, um, <laughs> and you'd be surprised how uh, easily people can pick up on that if you. <laughs> if you try to fool them like that well yeah and i just thought of another example uh same thing with daredevil uh, in the first season which literally it made me shake my head <laughs> um <laughs> so for those who don't know about daredevil he uh he's blind but uh because it's marvel his superpower is that he can hear things really well and uh <laughs> like basically you know he can dodge uh, attacks and stuff like that by using his mm -hmm. uh, hearing instead of his sight. Yeah, like sonar or something. Yeah. yeah. And in the first season, what really made me shake my head was they had the moments where, you know, the, the bad guy cocks the gun. Mm -hmm. But in modern day, as it is, <laughs> you don't need to do that. Yeah, they just needed the sound. Yeah, exactly. For, for story purposes. <laughs> exactly. So he hears the cocking of the gun and then he jumps out of the way. So it, uh, it it did really bring me out of the moment there. Yeah, that's. But uh, as I said, there we'll try and give a couple rules there. Of course, uh, tips really more like there's not rules that we've made up, but just kind of tips that we uh, we feel uh, are good for certain genres there. So start off with uh, fantasy. So of course, with uh, fantasy, you'll usually have magic, and. With magic, you know, uh, you can say, oh, it's just magic. But that will also sometimes bring people out of the moment. So it's good to establish rules for uh, your universe, how the magic works, how different things, you know, tie together, uh, who can use it, why it's important, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of the time... You know, it's uh, limited to certain people and has a really key importance in the story itself. Like, uh, especially if you look at, say, Wheel of Time. Like, it's <laughs> it's very intricate to the story itself, the ru the rules of magic and the role of it. Um, mm. And you don't always have to even explain everything right off the bat, but uh, definitely for yourself, you'll want to make a sort of primer so that you know what to do in certain situations. Uh, instead of making things up on the spot mm. it it definitely helps to have kind of a like an encyclopedia or we usually call them story bibles where you um you know you have a master document in which you list all the details of the various elements 
in your story world, and this will include things like the rules of your magic and maybe stuff like the origins of your magic and, uh, you know, who can use it, who can't, all of that. And, I mean, you'll go on to have maybe lists of your organizations, your kingdoms, how the rules work on all those things, different cultures, stuff like that. And uh, this kind of document's really helpful uh, to keep on top of all of this, all of these details. And for one thing, not contradict yourself, and for another, to have like a consistent uh, application. You know how you treat your characters, how the world reacts to them, so that you don't have one moment where this kind of action from a character has that kind of response, and then in the next book or even in the next chapter, suddenly character does exactly the same thing but the response is completely different you know? yeah this is just very general that i'm speaking of now yeah um look i know many people don't want to do story bibles because it, it seems like a lot of extra work and to be fair it is it's you have to have almost a whole new book just to explain what's going on in your other book that you're trying to write <laughs> yeah. but uh you know it's, it's a bit of a time investment that i think pays off the longer your story goes yeah, I mean, look at, uh, say, Game of Thrones even. I'm sure that uh, he has something that uh, he can kind of look off of there to help him out. And he takes a long time even between the books, but, you know, it's definitely paid off for him to uh, mm. to do that research and to be that thorough with his, uh, his world and his story. Mm, exactly. And uh, kind of on the other end there, we have uh, science fiction. So science fiction definitely is a, a very important one for um, suspending disbelief because, uh, you know, with magic and everything, you know, it, it's already kind of established that magic isn't real. So you can kind of suspend disbelief for that a lot easier than sometimes you would be able to with science fiction because uh, science fiction is supposed to be fairly close to what could actually be possible in the future. So uh, research is probably the biggest uh, biggest thing there, uh, very important, because you want to mix in sort of real science with uh, your made-up stuff, as it were, uh, <laughs> making sure not to put in something that's incorrect scientifically uh, will help make even the harshest critics into uh, believers. Um, Using sometimes the unknown is also helpful because if something that hasn't been proven yet, uh, if you use that, then, you know, people can't really disprove what you're saying about it. <laughs> so if you say have your characters travel through a black hole uh, somehow magically, you know, like, not magically, but scientifically <laughs> travel through a black hole, uh, beyond that, we don't really know what happens. So really almost anything you could do there would, uh, would kind of line up, but you definitely want to still research and see what the theories are and bring in, bring in some of that real theories to make, uh, make your story even more believable. Yeah. No, I think this is a, this is a great key to pulling it off when you're writing in sci-fi. Uh, and many of the other things as well, many other genres, I mean, uh, I mean, you, what I mean to say is you don't necessarily always need to prove that this thing that you're writing now is the truth um, or is correct. You just need to present the thing you write in such a way that people will have a hard time proving the opposite. You know, they, they won't really be, be able to prove that what you're saying could not be true in any universe, you know. That's, uh, that's a bit easier to do if you write that way. Yeah. And even if you look at uh, some of the more realistic side of things, like not Star Trek, but more thinking uh, The Martian here, uh, mm -hmm. when you look at The Martian and uh, kind of break that down, he really did his research on that, and it really helped uh, with the believability of the whole story because uh, he talked with people who knew more than he did about those certain subjects like botany and and uh, space travel and that sort of thing and tying all those things together there might definitely be a few uh, unbelievable things in the mix but uh, you know on a scale of one to ten I uh, personally I think it could have mostly uh, really happened like it really uh, I was very involved in the story through that and I think even uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, commented that 
uh, quite a bit of it was uh, true to true to life, essentially, mm. and uh, he has the, basically the backing of a real scientist there. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, and uh, just for general tips, of course, uh, not talking about science fiction or fantasy, uh, research is important just in general. So um, unless you establish something very well, it's going to take, take people out of the moment uh, unless you've done your research. And shows like Mythbusters can kind of help, uh, say, with more realistic settings, like more modern time settings, uh, because they've taken sort of these crazy ideas and uh, tested them out to see if they can actually happen. And uh, even if, say, the initial setup doesn't work, They'll take things to the next level and mm-hmm. kind of push it until that situation does work. So um, they'll just basically uh, say if they have uh, an explosive device and it doesn't blow up the car or whatever, <laughs> they'll they'll take it to the point where it does blow up the car. So you kind of know how much, say, TNT is needed to do a specific thing. And it's... Uh, really good to kind of use that in your own stories, and I'm sure there's a bunch of other examples with Mythbusters. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I actually have one of those. Um, they uh, at some point they tested the fulminated mercury from Breaking Bad. I don't know if you remember that scene where oh, he yeah, kind of yeah. throws down this little baggie and <laughs> kind of blows up that whole building. Yeah, and um, they tried that out. They made the fulminated mercury, and they they kind of had it there and they had you know they couldn't just drop it or for some reason they didn't just drop it they had a thing hitting it the whole time and it just didn't want to work <laughs> and in the end they had to do a, a whole bunch of tweaks to just get it to explode and i if i remember correctly it didn't even blow out the windows <laughs> of the office where in the show you know it was this nice and big explosion yeah. so so that's kind of you know the one thing that i wanted to mention is um it's good to keep in mind that uh Sometimes the true version of events, you know, the one that Mythbusters will end up showing you uh, or research will show you what is possible. Now, the true version of events is often not as cool as the Hollywood version. (laughs) But I mean, this is, of course, I say this for lack of a better term. I'm not just talking about movies, but we all know what Hollywood is. You know, it's Mm -hmm. everything is bigger, better, more badass. And one thing to realize is Many of those Hollywood movie producers, I'm sure they are completely aware that the situations they're depicting are not necessarily completely realistic. And um, even within the rules of the world, like, for instance, this this fulminated mercury thing from Breaking Bad, I'm I'm quite sure even if the show's producers knew beforehand um, that this wouldn't quite work this way in reality, I doubt they would have changed that scene because it was just so, you know, awesome and so pivotal to the story. Well, yeah, just even the setup of it, like, um, he just kind of holds in his hand and, like, you know, threatening it. It's almost like um, it kind of shows that he's better than, you know, holding a gun. Like, he could have held a gun, but he's instead holding, you know, something that kind of relates to uh, his profession, like he's a yeah, chemist, exactly. So. To his his entire character is kind of <laughs> put on trial there, and he kind of shows them all up, yeah. which is pretty cool. So, so that's one of the trade offs that you've got. Sometimes you kind of purposely have to choose between what is perfectly correct and what is awesome, and it's nice to find kind of a middle way there. And research will really help you do that. It'll kind of teach you what are the actual limits of reality, so that you know when you want to cross them and for what purpose Mm -hmm. yeah because uh like of course uh as we were saying before when you can suspend disbelief it's almost like uh pulling a curtain over it because something that i never even thought of until a lot after with that scene is if he was able to do that and it did bust out the windows and stuff like that uh the shock waves of such an explosion would have caused also internal damage to them <laughs> and that's yeah. kind of something that you learn from uh from mythbusters there as well is that you know the shock wave of an explosion is sometimes even uh catastrophic in and of its own right so yeah. even there like uh the artistic 
exploding the windows and everything would have probably caused them all to have some internal bleeding and <laughs> maybe some uh, exactly. some uh, broken ribs if it was that level of an explosion. Yeah. And I mean, not to mention Walter himself as well, because if you think about it, who was closer to the center of the explosion than he was? Yeah. How did he get out of the unscathed? Yeah. But, you know, that's part of the magic of this spell that they weave. You, mm -hmm. you don't always think of those details as you're in the scene. And uh, it's it's a bit of a risky move, but it does work sometimes. Yeah, and definitely uh, another tip there, uh, kind of relating to that, is sometimes anticipating the questions that some people will have over a certain situation, like, wouldn't that hurt him? You know, that sort of thing. Like, anticipating those questions is uh, definitely going to help you out in suspending disbelief. So, uh, say, like, you have a situation where there's a lot of action scenes going on, uh, the characters in a car, you know, maybe somebody might uh, ask, like, well, how did the tires not get blown out? Or why didn't the bad guys try to aim for the tires and that sort of thing? So even just having the characters making comments after the fact about how lucky they were, maybe that'll be enough to kind of help suspend mm -hmm. disbelief, even if it's kind of after the fact a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this trick is uh, is is pretty cool. It's oh wow, I sound like one of those ads you see online. Just uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> fix up your story with this one cool trick. So just <laughs> click click here and give me all your money. No, this uh, this really is a, is a nice trick that I uh, often advise people to use when they're writing fiction. Is um, you know when something really unbelievable happens, um, look either you have to edit it out to make it more believable, or on the other hand, you can sometimes. You, you might be able to get away with it as long as you make sure you're not trying to hide the fact that this totally incredible thing just happened. Mm -hmm. So what, what you can do is just exactly like you said now. You, you can make your characters comment on how crazy lucky they just were. As in, you know, you as the author, you're purposely drawing attention to the fact that, well, this is, this is, uh, you know, quite lucky for them. How, you know, how lucky for them. And then what happens is because you were willing to point it out, there's this weird thing that happens to a reader or a watcher, and they tend to give you a little more leeway. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> simply for the fact, you know, it sounds like a parent that's willing to not punish the child because the child came and admitted to breaking <laughs> the window instead of trying to hide it. it. I think it works exactly like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it's uh, it's definitely still all a uh, balancing act, of course, uh, as you were mentioning there. Like you need to kind of find that uh, balance between uh, putting something in unbelievable and uh, trying to set it up in such a way so that it's not unbelievable. Uh, you don't want to have too many times, of course, of this happening. Like, oh, we were so lucky that we didn't get shot for the fifth time, type thing. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, definitely. Definitely. To yeah. write responsibly. Yeah. <laughs> write responsibly. <laughs> oh, use responsibly, man. <laughs> don't, don't drink and write. <laughs> well, I heard that can be pretty cool to do your first draft in. What do they say? Write drunk and edit sober? <laughs> Maybe we'll so. have to have another uh, podcast about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so those are uh, just a few tips for helping uh, suspend disbelief there. Uh, why don't you let us know in the comments uh, if there have been any situations, you know, in movies or books or anything like that where you've kind of had a little trouble suspending disbelief and uh, mm -hmm. how you might have changed it around even to uh, make it a little bit better. Yeah. And uh, once again, thank you for joining us here at Second Drafts Podcast. Please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on everything you need to write, edit, and publish your way. And let us know what you'd like to see from us in future podcasts. See you next time. Cool. Cheers, guys. Do you want to support production of this YouTube series? Visit www.patreon.com slash and become a patron today.